power one of the teams by standing here. So, uh, Myron Goldsmith uh, has a bachelor's and master's in architecture. Uh, he studied in Rome on a Fulbright grant. He has taught at the Illinois Institute of Technology and the Graduate School of Architecture. He is licensed in nine states as both an architect and an engineer with NCARB certification. He worked with several firms before serving in the Corps of Engineers as a bridge designer during World War II. He then worked with Mies van der Rohe and also studied with Nervi in Rome. He joined SOM San Francisco as a chief structural engineer in 1955. He moved to the Chicago office as senior architectural designer and participating associate in 1958. He became an associate partner in 1961 and a general partner in 1967. He has worked on rapid transit stations for the Kennedy and Dan Ryan Expressways in Chicago, the Oakland Alameda County Coliseum, the Euro Point Office Building in Rotterdam, Holland, a central business district plan for Columbus and one for Elkhart. And I also confirmed that uh, he did work on uh, United Airlines Executive Office Building and the Solar Telescope at Kitt yeah. Peak National Observatory. No, Dave. He had an ex exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1964. Mr. Goldsmith uh, has received numerous rewards for the projects I mentioned, plus there. becoming a fellow in the American Institute of Architecture there? in 1972. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Myron Goldsmith. Let me check and see what's happening then. We just have I've changed the lights. starting with the slides and uh, and uh, after it, the talk is over I'll be very glad to answer any questions that you have so why don't we uh, darken the room and we can start uh, as the, these I want to see if this pointer works not very well but uh, the subject of the talk is long span structures and I'm going to speak uh, primarily about building structures but first a few words of what is the uh, particular uh, meaning of a of a long span structure, and I think we can start with this diagram of bridges of, yeah, of different structural types. The, the longest spans of which are drawn to the same scale. For example, the bridge at the top is a suspension bridge. It happens to be uh, uh, the, the longest uh, bridge of uh, uh, the Verrazano uh, Bridge in uh, New York, uh, and a span something like about 3,500 feet of the central span. And then uh, thereafter, uh, the uh, cantilever truss, the next longest span of the Quebec Bridge, about 1,500 feet. Uh, the steel arch below it uh, in Australian 
also about 1,500 feet, and below that we rapidly decreased to trusses of a, a span under 1,000, a plate girder of a span in the uh, neighborhood of 1,000 feet. Now, uh, this chart is intended to show that in any structure, as the size changes, uh, you get a new structural type. Uh, this, uh, for, for example, when you're in the range of over 2,000 feet, it's coming through. There, okay. There Good just check. isn't any other uh, kind of bridge, but uh, a suspension span. And when you're at something in the range of uh, four or five hundred feet, there's a whole series of other types of, of uh, bridges that are more economical and more appropriate. So uh, there is a, a uh, we've studied this uh, scalar phenomena and perhaps Dr. Kahn, who addressed you before, uh, spoke of it for tall buildings, that uh, in a 20-story building, you have a certain type of structure. And if you're at 80 stories, the same structure just no longer works. You, you just can't uh, increase the size and, and still uh, get any kind of economy. And, and in fact, you may not, uh, it probably wouldn't be possible at all. So there is a kind of uh, general uh, theory that you can say about structures that for every given size, there is a, a type and at the extreme uh, length, at the extreme size, there's probably only one type that will even work at all. And in the lower r ranges, perhaps most types will work. There, there comes a crossing point where many of the types work. I showed this about bridges because it's the clearest. But uh, we'll go on to building structures and uh, where the same rules hold. Uh, th this first is uh, the, the uh, Golden Gate Bridge, and uh, it, it's just simply structure. There are no architectural problems imposed on it. Uh, uh, this is a project of mine for a shorter span of building, actually a competition for the Garibaldi Bridge in Rome out of uh, thin shell concrete. Another view of it. Now, we did a study. In fact, uh, we, uh, uh, it was done by David Sharp will be here tomorrow, of uh, different kinds of, of uh, long span roofs, the different kinds of structures that are possible. And this is, is uh, 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 indicates uh, a, uh, the truss structures. Now, his study included uh, dozens and dozens of structures, perhaps uh, well over a hundred, in which uh, uh, existing structures were studied, their uh, spans and their weights per square foot were recorded, this, this part of the study. Uh, this uh, is, is a group of uh, rigid frames. Uh, the uh, uh, the number, I noticed that A is cut off, but it doesn't matter. Uh, C is a rigid frame for a hanger, and the scale you can see it is uh, 
160 feet foot span. Uh, e, for example, is uh, uh, probably well over 200 feet span. Uh, in the previous slide, we were talking of rather large span types in the range of about 300 feet, the kind that are uh, most often used to cover uh, auditoriums and, uh, and sports uh, halls. They, they would cover, for example, a standard hockey rink. These are uh, the three hinged arch, arches. And uh, B is, is uh, the gallery of machines, which most of you know from your architectural histories, built about in the 1890s with a span approaching 300 feet. Uh, these are the dome structures, and uh, uh, at the uh, top is a typical lamella type shown in plan and section, and below is, the, uh, is one of Fuller's uh, geodesic domes. Now, all of these and many more were plotted, they were graphed and plotted uh, to try to see what happened to the steel weight which span. Uh, this is uh, how uh, they were graphed. Uh, the uh, horizontal scale is, is feet, uh, starting at 300 feet and going at the left end and about 1,000 feet at the right end. The um, vertical s s uh, scale is pounds of structure per square foot, starting uh, with zero at the lower corner and going up to 40 pounds per square uh, foot. Uh, the, trust, the, the graph at the top is what happens to the weight of trusses at about 400 feet they're going up very rapidly. Uh, the graph below is two-way space frames, which has a very much lower curve. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, and then we, we have a whole bunching of geodesic domes, lamella domes, and cable-supported roof structures on a, uh, an, a, an a lower line. And the graph is interesting. If you have a certain span, you could very nearly pick off how much that span would weigh per square foot for the structure, for a given structure. Now, there's another graph, which I do not have, which uh, graphs cost. Uh, now, the cost curves are slightly different from these, but in general follow the same uh, pattern. Now, uh, what do they, what do these graphs show, these graphs show? Uh, that uh, um, around 300 feet, they're all very much bunched. Uh, the trusses will come down to uh, intersect that. But as you go into the longer spans, around uh, uh, 700 feet or more, uh, most structures drop out, and there are the domes and the uh, suspension structures that are the only two really valid structures uh, that you can work with, with any degree of economy at those spans. Uh, this uh, was a, a project for, for a uh, reversed dome, a suspended dome. It was uh, for a stadium in Portland. And uh, this is the kind of roof out of concrete that was proposed. And this is a reflected plan of the 
uh, well, a view from below of the roof. And uh, this structure was later realized in the uh, Oakland uh, State uh, uh, Coliseum project, and it's the enclosed building on the extreme right, uh, the open football baseball stadium is shown on the left. And this, these are some more views of the project at night. You can see the roof inside set up for track. Now this is a concrete roof. This is the plan. It's the uh, plan of the structure above. It's, it's a circle about 350 feet in diameter. This uh, shows the two stadiums in uh, section. Uh, a detailed cross-section uh, reflected uh, Ceiling, a half-reflected ceiling plan of that structure. Uh, uh, various other things are shown on the plan, including ventilation and lighting. Now, this is a long-span building of uh, two stories. It's an office building for United Airlines and it has a 60-foot square bay in pre-stressed concrete. This is the plan. You have uh, roughly uh, three cores, which you can see containing uh, meeting rooms and toilets, and stairways, and courts be between the cores. And you can see the very large column spacing of, of uh, 60 feet square. It's another view of the same building. Now, I worked on a number of hangar projects, and this is a cantilever hangar for uh, uh, planes of the size of the DC-8. You can see the core in the center of shops and the column. Uh, at the edge of the core, and the uh, uh, roof is cantilevering 150 feet beyond the core. It's a model. It's a building under construction. There's a concrete structure with uh, steel plate girders above under construction. Some idea of the scale and the workmen making that joint. It's a, another view. Uh, the roof. Uh, in the same uh, complex, we did this uh, hangar for washing airplanes out of a rigid frame of 160 foot span, which I referred to before. Inside. Now, I, uh, here's a series of uh, projects by my students of airplane hangars using various uh, Structures. And I should uh, digress a little bit here and say that whereas uh, in bridges, uh, because of the large variation in span, you uh, get very much driven to a, a type of structure, for example, I referred before. If you're in the 2,000 foot range uh, there, or above, there's just no possibility for anything else but in a suspension span. 
uh, in buildings, the spans are usually much more modest. And uh, you have a bunching, for example, in arenas at about uh, three or 400 foot uh, span. You can use either a truss or a dome or perhaps an arch with very similar economies. And therefore, the architect does begin to have a choice of which kind of structure he'll pick to, uh, to uh, conform to what his architectural uh, requirements are, what, his, what is reasonable, and uh, just what he, uh, uh, maybe even a preference. Now, uh, this is one of a group of student hangers. There are two edge girders, and it's filled in with a steel folded plate. It's another view of that project. And uh, here is uh, another type of construction for that hanger. There are girders spanning uh, 160 feet and a folded plate of uh, this type above it. Another view of that hangar. Uh, this was a project by, uh, this is a series of big roof projects by students. This is a museum and uh, uh, a big long span roof on columns at the midpoint of each Face. The roof's about 300 feet square. It's another view of it was to be used as a uh, railroad museum. Uh, this, another student did a sports uh, complex in which a track, which you could identify the lower left, and a, a uh, arena for about 10,000 spectators were put under one roof. And this roof consists of four bays of about 400 feet span. And this is a view of that building. Now, uh, one student studied suspension structures, and uh, he chose a very large exhibition hall of uh, 1,000 by 2,000. In fact, his problem was to put, uh, uh, was, was to put many of the buildings of the Montreal World Fair under one roof. And, uh, I don't know whether you can all see the column pattern in the uh, second from the left and the third from the left, but uh, the, these were three different column patterns that were done uh, using different structures, but all having the same economy. On the left, is a clear span hall of a thousand feet using a suspension structure. In the uh, center is uh, a column system of about uh, 250 by 250 foot square bays. Uh, uh, I think they're 290 uh, using a a uh, two-way grid system. And beyond that is, uh, is another rather linear system of uh, uh, somewhere about 300 foot span, not quite, about 250 foot span using a one-way truss system. But if it becomes important that you want a clear span of such dimensions, then you, you really have to go to a, uh, 
for economy to a suspension structure, and what will follow is his project. But, uh, uh, the student's name is uh, Peter Pran. Uh, this is another uh, long span uh, roof structure in concrete by another student. Uh, this was to uh, uh, cover uh, a stadium for football, and the spans uh, are in the order of, I, as I recall, about 500. Now, um, we, we were invited to uh, participate in uh, a competition for the Osaka, uh, for the U.S. Pavilion at Osaka. And this is the plan. You can see the columns at 150 foot spacing. And what will follow was our proposal for Osaka. It was uh, based on a student's uh, 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 problem. Uh, uh, the student was, name was Larry Kinney. But this is the corner of the building. Uh, this is the kind of uh, suspension from a mast uh, that you can, you can, I think all of you can see the cables that radiate out from the c center mass and the extreme thinness and lightness of the roof construction. The uh, beams were in the order of uh, 16 or 18 inches deep uh, suspended on this cable system. Uh, you begin to, in this slide, look into the interior of the exhibit. Uh, this gives you another a detail of the roof and the, the upper and lower cables that suspended the columns. It is an extremely light structure uh, weighing no more than about four pounds a square foot. This shows some of the detail of the exhibit. And it was to be glazed in this fashion. Uh, another student did uh, an urban university. And in this, uh, these are, uh, the idea was that you would build this uh, that you, you would build this school in three stages. It was based a little bit on the program of the uh, University of Illinois at Congress Circle. And uh, the dark spaces are uh, light courts. And uh, uh, this shows some of the complexity of the plan. Uh, this is one of the uh, bigger courts. Uh, this was built of uh, precast concrete on a hundred foot bay, a uh, hundred foot square bays. But uh, there, there's something about these long spans that uh, create a, a kind of new type of architecture, which uh, the span, the, the space in itself does it. I think that finishes the first, does that finish the first tray? Uh, there's one more tray. Uh, the next tray will be uh, about the Olympics, uh, the buildings for the Olympics in Munich. And uh, uh, they 
in, in my opinion, they're one of the most remarkable uh, group of uh, buildings that, that I've seen. Uh, I think many of you have, have seen the Olympics uh, buildings at Munich Public, but it was an enormous uh, complex. And uh, the Germans uh, decided that uh, they were, uh, that uh, to offset the bad impression uh, made by the Olympics in, uh, I, in, in the 30s, that they were going to do a very, very uh, elaborate uh, facility uh, of, uh, of which would uh, show the best of German art and technology. And uh, this is the uh, plan of them. Uh, it, uh, an enormous site, very close to the center of Munich. Uh, and the idea was to insert these, as you know, these were tent-like structures, and to insert these in uh, a landscape that had been enormously molded by a lot of, of uh, earth moving. There, uh, the lakes you see in blue are artificial lakes. Uh, they're part of a canal system. The upper end is the Olympic housing. The stadiums proper are in the center. Uh, this is the group of stadiums. There's uh, the one at the extreme left, left is the uh, open air uh, stadium for uh, track, which uh, seats 80,000. And in the middle distance, uh, there's uh, a enclosed stadium for 14,000. And at the extreme uh, right is the swimming stadium, about 11,000. Uh, this is a closer view of the uh, stadium for track, and in the upper part is a section. And uh, this is the uh, indoor events stadium. Uh, th these were enormous tent structures in the order of, um, in, in this case, uh, uh, you're spanning well over 400 feet. Uh, and this was the largest uh, use of, uh, scaled use of tents by far up, uh, up to that time. And here's the swimming stadium. Now, uh, this, it, these are some aerial views. Uh, this is the housing. Uh, in the upper part is the open stadium for track, and you can see the roofs of the closed stadium on the right, and the uh, and the swimming pool on the left. And here you're coming closer. The right again is the enclosed stadium you see the edge of the swimming pool on the left. Uh, this, you're looking down on the pool. The white portion is temporary for to get the required amount of seating, and it's later removed to make a more reasonable size of civic swimming pool. This is some of the lake, uh, as you can see. Uh, uh, here, uh, this is during the Olympics, some of the enormous crowds that simply came to uh, sit and watch. There was a certain amount of uh, entertainment going on out uh, with uh, the uh, Olympic events occurring inside the stadium.
uh, a little bit removed this as a kind of entertainment section, the swimming pool on the extreme right and the enclosed stadium in the, cent in the upper center. Some more views, the swimming pool on the right. This is some of the crowds. There's uh, some kind of show taking place in the water. The uh, open stadium is in the background. It's at dusk. Uh, they had an enormous sculptured and landscaped hill opposite these stadiums, and uh, uh, the, the whole composition was beautiful. Uh, some of the uh, crowds uh, along the lake. So, parks. You can see the stadium uh, appearing on the left, the uh, artificial hills in the background. Now, we're going to come close to the uh, track stadium. We're on the back side. I get some idea of the enormous scale of it is it, it's uh, the roof it is uh, of uh, transparent gray plastic uh, you see some of the beautiful connections that were made to uh, tie uh, several cables together it's a view underneath the stand Now we're uh, inside the, uh, entering inside the stadium proper. And we're under the stands, but inside the stadium. These are where food and drinks are sold, the, the orange kiosk. <coughs> now, we're inside at an event. And the reason for the transparent roof is apparent that uh, it's uh, not to cast a shadow uh, on the track that will get you into trouble with television, because all of these events were uh, televised. And uh, in other words, the uh, the exposure uh, between full light and shade was still within uh, television tolerances. And uh, in fact, uh, they did it extremely well. When seated in the stands, you felt sheltered, and yet uh, there was enough transparency out on the field in order not to uh, uh, kill the television performance. This inside uh, under the cover. There are a series of views. Uh, you can see the transparency of the of the roof. details of the connections. Looking from the, uh, out on the field with the stadium empty at night. Uh, the whole effect was something uh, very festive and, and, and uh, I, I'd say very fabulous. It's another view at night. Uh, this is outside, going from the stadium toward uh, uh, toward the uh, enclosed uh, 
uh, going from the open stadium toward the enclosed stadium. Uh, this is the closed stadium. Now, when you enclose under these kind of free-form roofs, you have enormous problems which are not very elegantly solved. That is this glass wall coming up against the free form. Uh, it, they did very well on it, but, it, but it's an almost insolvable architectural problem, including having to provide for uh, deflections up and down of uh, almost uh, a total of perhaps three feet uh, with res where the roof meets the glass wall. This is uh, going in to the entrance, some of the architectural problems that they were involved in. Another view of an entrance. Now, we're inside the uh, stadium uh, at an event, and uh, uh, this uh, one of the remarkable things, uh, just as a aside, they had uh, apparently solved the problem of uh, proper color of their artificial light because I'm using uh, daylight film in, in this interior and you can see that the colors are true. The red, uh, yellow, and blue jerseys. Uh, they, it's, and they're using a, a kind of uh, mercury vapor light, and it's something we haven't been able to uh, to resolve in, in this country yet. Now we're in the swimming pool. Uh, that this is a daylight shot, and uh, the uh, glass roof is covered by an inner skin for insulating purposes, which becomes translucent, insulating and, I think, a certain amount of shading from glare. <coughs> this is the pool. Another view uh, of the pool, diving pool in the foreground. Another view. Uh, these are uh, a series of details of the roof. Uh, the, the dark lines that form squares are the edges of the sheets and with uh, neoprene gaskets to, uh, with neoprene co co connections which allow a certain movement of the uh, sheets with respect to the cables, and uh, all the black dots are neoprene uh, supports which will allow this movement. This is an anchorage. <coughs> this is a, a, uh, a detail of the outside of that skin and uh, these connections to each other. It, at close view, it looks quite crude, but in the distances you normally see it, it it's, it's very acceptable. Uh, here's some of the uh, connections, the changes of directions for the cables on Castile anchorages and saddles. the view of this is another type of saddle. Now, uh, the dimensions and the structures, this is a detail of the uh, drawing of the roof 
with the stand below. The span from where, from the uh, edge where the roof intersects the columns to the outer edge is in the order of uh, 225 feet, which would rank it with the largest cantilevers ever uh, built. It, uh, this is about the dimensions you need uh, for these cantilever hangers for the 747. Uh, the outer edge is a continuous cable in an arc that uh, forms a, a, a horizontal suspension with about 1,400 foot span. So we have just enormous dimensions. Uh, this shows in detail uh, how some of the stresses work. A at the far right is a uh, detail how the saddle-shaped nets, by being pre-stressed in two directions, get their stability against uh, uplift and and uh, vertical loads due to snow. In the center, uh, you see the forces of the, uh, uh, how the forces are resolved from the loads of the roof. And on the far left, how two sections come together and are uh, suspended in a kind of three-dimensional view. Now, uh, the, the, uh, as a technical feat, this was impressive. The cables were laid out on the ground and then hoisted in place, and you see three successive stages in how that roof was erected. This, this is the swimming, uh, I believe this, this is the swimming pool. No, no, it's the, uh, the enclosed stadium roof. Now, uh, these structures were enormously expensive. The, uh, the roof cost about $60 a square foot. And to give you some idea of the enormity of it, uh, a normal office building uh, runs about 30 for the whole building, including the air conditioning. And this uh, roof ran uh, double that per square foot for only the roof. And it, it was, uh, in, in fact, a kind of uh, national uh, debate going on whether they should have built the roof. Uh, I think the roof cost in the order of $48 million for all those roofs. But the uh, Germans spent uh, $600 million on the um, facilities for the Olympics. Uh, that's uh, just uh, when, when we say facilities, they built roads and s new subways and uh, uh, all the housing for the athletes. So th for that sum of money, they got uh, a, a, a uh, lot of permanent things which they would have not otherwise gotten, but uh, the lavish at which they funded these, the, these games is uh, something nobody else had ever done. Well, the engineers uh, were very interested in this system. The engineers were a very good German firm of Leonard and Andra. I should say that the stadium buildings were 
<coughs> done by a firm of architects called uh, Genther Banish and Associates. Uh, most of you will recognize that these are, uh, uh, that they're ba the roofs are based on an idea which Fry Otto had worked on for so long. He was involved in this project. He was brought in at a later stage. Uh, it was a competition. Uh, Banish won this competition. Uh, uh, and then brought in the engineers, Leonard Nandra and Fry Otto to realize the project. Well, after it was over, the uh, engineers tried to see if they could not cheapen this uh, roof by using uh, purely, uh, by using more rigorous uh, engineering methods. And this was a proposal for a covering of, of, uh, of an existing st uh, stadium at Hanover. And uh, it, uh, as you can see, it's a much simpler thing. And they got the roof cost down to $40 a square foot, which is still of almost 60% uh, more than it would have cost in normal construction. So we have to, uh, they have to ask ourselves, is it a one-shot thing that's only applicable to the kinds of World's Fairs and Olympic Games that, uh, where you relatively have unlimited money or does the idea have general validity? And uh, they proposed, uh, this is another view of the Hanover Stadium, which incidentally uh, uh, was, will, was not going to be built in this way. But the engineers proposed this suspension system for enormous cooling towers. And uh, I, I think most of you have seen these pictures of these hyperbolic uh, concrete cooling towers. Well, when they get very enormous, uh, the concrete has instability problems, and it becomes uh, economical to do this on a suspension structure. Now, these towers are 600 feet high, and uh, uh, and, and, and one of them, uh, the first of them, are now being built because they are, them are now being built because they are less expensive than any other way. Uh, this is another view of the skinning of the tower. Uh, that concludes uh, my uh, part of the uh, formal part of the lecture, and I'll be very glad to answer any questions you have. Um, yes. Well, uh, They've, uh, I think, hopefully, uh, indefinitely. Uh, the, uh, it's an experimental, uh, I got the impression that it's experimental and it was done in great haste. And they uh, went, in fact, it was done in such haste that they had to go back and then, although the cables were galvanized, they went, ba they went back on the roof in order to, to uh, better protect them. Some of the main cables were, are, are protected in plastic sheets. 
Now, uh, the, I, I think if it's properly done, uh, perhaps with cables protected in plastic sheaths, the life expectancy should be indefinite, just as uh, in a suspension bridge. Uh, they may have some maintenance problems on this because of the haste in which they did it. Well, um, of course, uh, the, the main material is acrylic, which, which, is, uh, uh, which has a almost indefinite life. Indefinite, it must have a certain number of years, but I, I think the life is well above 20 or 30 years. Now what, uh, there's, there again is a little uncertainty about the neoprene gasket, gasketing and what its constant flexing and exposure to ultraviolet of the sun might be. Uh, I think we'll have to, to see Many of these, the whole thing is very experimental. Uh, they kind of went into it with their eyes open. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, they did appropriate, they did appropriate uh, something like uh, uh, $50 million for the long time uh, upkeep of it so as not to burden the uh, city of Munich with it. The, the project was basically financed by the federal government, the state of Bavaria, and the <laughs> Munich government. So there may be some problems. Yes? Well, right now, these things are kind of in high technology, uh, aircraft uh, uh, technology. And um, there's, uh, I think there's a serious question whether materials as sophisticated as that will really ever in fact be, be uh, really economical. Uh, I, I think um, the, the technology is, uh, as you can see, is fairly far advanced. There's high strength cables and the acrylic plastics, which are uh, quite stable over long periods. Uh, I think the question is uh, one of, uh, of maybe corrosion, stress corrosion, things like that, which they're not quite sure about. I, I get the impression they're not quite sure about any of them. Yes? The acrylic is starting to turn black. Uh, it's not the acrylic. Uh, over the swimming, the enclosed structures, the swimming pool and the enclosed stadium. They have a insulation between that kind of canvas blanket you saw on the outside. Well, very high temperatures developed in this space in which the insulation began to turn black. And, and there's a project on now of how to replace it and with what to replace it. But as far as I know, the acrylic itself has not had any problem. It's that insulation blanket that has. Are there any further questions? Well, uh, then if there aren't, then uh, thank you very much.